tells us that God loves us. In fact, one of the most well-known attributes about God is that he is love, 1 John 4 and verse 8. The truth is that God loves us, but what if somebody pressed you? What if somebody said, how do you know that God loves you? Well, we could look at the fact that God created us. In Psalm 100 and verse 3, the Bible says, Know ye not that the Lord, he is God, it is he that has made us and not we ourselves, for we are the sheep of his hand and the people of his pasture. God not only made us and created us, but the Bible also says that God provides for us. In Acts 14 and verse 17, when Paul and Barnabas were on their first missionary journey, they went to a town of Lystra and the people there tried to offer sacrifices to them as if they were God. And Paul restrained them with these words that God left not himself without witness and that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Have you eaten today? Well, that's part of the testament to the fact that God loves us. God created us. God provides for us. But more than that, God shows his love toward us and that he gave his only begotten son. John 3 and verse 16 has been called the golden text of the Bible, and it truly is gold. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves us. He created us. God provides for us. And God gave his son in our place. But more than that, God provides a plan of salvation whereby we can be saved. The Bible teaches us that by believing on Jesus as the Christ, turning from our sins, confessing him as Lord and being immersed in water, we can have our sins forgiven and rise to walk in a newness of life. And so truly all of us can know that God loves us. And we might take that knowledge and be overwhelmed by it, and rightly so, and then wonder, what does God want from me in return? What can I do for a God who's shown so much love toward me? People have wrestled with this question down through the centuries. How do I respond to a God who is so loving, so kind, so benevolent? 700 years before Jesus, in the days of Micah, people wondered about this question. question. In Micah 6, 6 through 8, the people say, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord? What will please him? 10,000 rivers of oil, the firstborn of my body for the sin of my soul, a thousand calves and rams to be offered in sacrifice. And Micah responds by inspiration in Micah 6 in verse 8 and says, He showed you, O man, what is good. And what the Lord requires of you, but to do justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In 1 John 5 and verse 3, the Bible tells us that this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous or burdensome. In a word, though God could demand so much from you and so much from me, what God wants from us is he wants us to love him back in return. The last week of Jesus's life was a trying week for certain. In Mark chapter 12, we have an account, or we have it recorded in that account, what Jesus' last week was like and the various things that he encountered. In Mark 12, 13 through 17, Jesus is approached by the Herodians. And we're told there that they have a question about taxes. Is it lawful to pay taxes or tribute unto Caesar or not? Jesus says, show me a coin whose image and superscription is on it. They say to him, Caesar's. He says, well, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that belong to God. And next come the Sadducees. In Mark 12, 18 through 27, you have the Sadducees come questioning Jesus about marriage. And they say uh, seven different men had a woman to wife. They each died in succession and none of them raised up children. According to the Levitical law, they were to each step in and take the other's place and raise up seed. Well, none of them did. In the resurrections, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be since all of them had her wife? Jesus told him, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but there is the angels. And then finally, in Mark 12, 28, one of the scribes comes to Jesus and says, what's the greatest command in the law? And Jesus responds. But before we talk about Jesus's response, it's important to see that this is a trick question, or at least the Pharisee, the scribe, believes it will be. There were 613 commands in the Old Covenant as tallied up by the rabbis after some of Jesus's time. They had 365 negative commands, 248 positive, totaling the 613. And so when this scribe says in Mark 12, 28, what's the greatest command in the law? They think they have Jesus. Whichever way he chooses to go, we'll have him pinned. But without batting an eye, Jesus responds in Mark 12, 29. The first of all the commandments is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And the second is not like, namely this. You will love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, there is no other commandment greater than these, Jesus says. He quotes Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 and Leviticus 19, 18, pairs them together. And he says, essentially, 
That's what the entire Old Testament's about. Loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus lays it out there so that individuals could understand it and could grasp it. I know what Jesus taught was not meant to be broken down into individual compartments and parts. What Jesus is saying essentially is love God and your neighbor with your whole being. But the truth is that can't be done without the individual components and parts. And so let's do that. Let's look at the individual things that Jesus mentions in Mark 12, 29 down through 31, and see how we can truly love God who loves us so very much. Four things. One, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. That's what God wants us to do, to love him with all of our heart and with all of our soul. We need to have this response toward God that says, I really care about you. Now, this can be fate. At the end of the book of Colossians, Colossians chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2, in verses 20 down through verse 23, we read about what Paul calls will worship. Those that practice asceticism and those that practice mysticism and they afflict the body. And Paul says none of those things does anything to satisfy or help to cultivate a good soul. But in Deuteronomy 10, 12 through 13, Moses wrote that God has taught his people to love him with the heart, soul, mind and strength, gave us these commands for our good that we might obey them. And so God wants us not to practice emotionalism, but there is a biblical emotion that we should have toward God in response of all that he's done toward us. And that is to love God with all of our heart and with all of our soul. Why do you obey God? Why do you do the things that God has told you to do? Is it just because you're good at keeping the rules? In Matthew 23, we read about the Pharisees who were at least partially good at doing what God had told them to do, but they didn't do it all the way. Maybe somebody says, well, I do what God has commanded of me because I don't want to go to hell. And in Matthew 10 and verse 28, the Bible says that if we love God, we should love him because he's able to cast both body and soul into hell. Fear not him that can destroy the body, but after that has nothing that he can do. But instead, fear the one that can destroy both body and soul in hell. Fear of God because of hell is a good motivation for obedience, at least in the initial outset. But it's not enough to keep a person faithful for the long haul. In 1 John four nineteen, the Bible says... We love him because he first loved us. What if we do what God has said and obey him simply because we love him? That's what he ultimately wants. Jesus says, love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul. I read an article in the Huffington Post about why marriages don't last as long as they used to. And there were various answers given. But the one that stuck out to me was this says we are more connected than ever before, yet we're still disconnected. And that's true. We can order flowers for our spouse from an app. We can text in the same house. There are just so many things that we can do that keep us disjointed, separated one from another. And we can be more connected through phones and technology than ever before and yet disconnected all at the same time. It can get to the point in our relationships that it's no longer personal. It's just business. Friend, as it relates to our relationship to God, it is always personal and never just business. It always matters. It always counts. And so we need to make sure our heart is in it. Think about the passages that teach us that God wants our heart and our soul. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. Sing and make melody to the Lord in your heart. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16. We just cannot respond to God without doing so. Pro we can't do it properly without doing it with all of our heart, and with all of our soul. Are you happy to be a Christian? Do you love to serve God? It's one thing to simply go through the motions and do what God has asked us for, but it's another thing to really be engaged, to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, Philippians 4, 4, to know that the joy of the Lord is your strength, Nehemiah 8, 10. To rejoice evermore, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 16. See, that involves the heart, that involves the soul. And that's what God wants from us. God wants us to respond to him the right way because we really want to please him, because we really do love him with everything that we have within us. God's interested in that, and we should do our best to render that to him when we come before him in worship. Do we love God with all of our heart? Do we love God with all of our soul? What about the songs that we sing? What about when we pray the prayers? What about when we come to worship? Is there any part of us that's really not interested in doing that, that really doesn't want to carry that out. You know, that doesn't please God. Just to go through the motions, just to check the boxes, God won't be pleased. Jesus says, God not only wants your body, but God wants your heart, God wants your soul, and God wants mine. 
I know we're not under the old covenant, but just think for a moment about the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms addresses just about every human emotion that we have. And one thing I know about the psalmist is that he was interested, no matter who the psalmist was, whether it was Korah or David or Asaph or Moses or Solomon, the individuals that penned the Psalms not only wanted people to have the right biblical response to God, but they wanted them to have the right biblical disposition toward God. Psalm 18 and verse one, the psalmist says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. Psalm 100 and verse 2, the psalmist says, Come before the Lord's presence with gladness, come before him with singing. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Psalm 103, verse 1. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is clothed with majesty and honor. Psalm 104, verse 1. O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. That's the first verse of Psalm 106. It's repeated in Psalm 107. And then in verse 2, of Psalm 107, he says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who he has delivered out of the hands of the enemy. Who is that more true of if it's not true of Christians? We've been redeemed out of the hand of our greatest enemy, that is sin and death. And so we should love God with everything that we have within us. If I'm a parent, this matters. Because the passage that Jesus quoted when questioned by the scribe, Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Love him with heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's right on the heels of that passage? You know this verse. We've often quoted it, but often disjoint it from its context. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9 says, And these words which I command you this day will be in your heart, and you'll teach them diligently to your children, and you'll talk of them when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you sit down in the house, when you rise up. You'll write them as frontlets before your eyes. They'll be as signposts on your gates. What will be? What he had just said before, love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I must ask myself, and you must do the same. Oh, my children know that we go to worship, and they know that we read the Bible, and they know that we give of our means. Do they know that we do those things because we really love God? With all of our heart and with all of our soul. That's what Moses had just finished saying. And then he says these words. Now, that included more than just the two verses in Deuteronomy 6, but it also included them. He says these words. Teach them diligently to your children. Say, we do what we're doing because we're Christians and we really want to love God with everything that we have. Number two, Jesus says, I want you to love God with all of your mind. That would involve our intellect. There are a lot of people in the religious world that want to have an emotional response toward God. They're very interested in giving of their their emotions toward God. They want to weep and wail and shout but they're not really interested in the intellectual side of Christianity. We must never forget that Christianity is a thinking man and women's religion. And that is when we are taught the right things of God, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We're to love God with all of our mind. Does God have your mind? Does God have my mind? We live in a land filled with Bibles where the average household has four Bibles at the very least. But does God have our mind? Again, appeal to the psalmist. In Psalm 1 and verse 2, the blessed man is described as the one who meditates in the law day and night. Psalm 119, not only the longest psalm, but the longest chapter in all of the Bible with 176 verses. In just about every verse, he not only mentions the law of God, but more than that, his love for that very law. Psalm 119 and verse 97, the psalmist says, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Psalm 119 and verse 9, he begins with, How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart have I sought you, O let me not wander from your commandments. Your words have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I will meditate on your precepts, have respect unto your ways, delight myself in your statutes. I won't forget your law, Psalm 119, 15 and 16. It's sweet to my taste, sweeter than honey to my lips. Psalm 119, 103, the psalmist says, the words a lamp to his feet, the words a light to his path. Are we convinced when we read Psalm 119 that this was composed by an individual, no doubt inspired of the Holy Spirit, but one who loved his God and loved the word of God? Yes, he loved Leviticus. Yes, he loved Deuteronomy. He loved the entirety of God's law, and it was his delight to study it and to put it into practice. And we need to do the very same thing. We need to be lovers of the word of God. Bible study is a means to an end. I don't, I understand that. I understand there'll be no heavenly Bible bowl. If it was, Paul would make fools of us all, right? And so we're studying the word of God and loving God with all of our mind for the purpose of going toward a place. And that place is ultimately heaven with God. But it comes as we learn God's word. There is no one who really loves God 
the God of the word who doesn't love the word of God. You just can't, you can't have it both ways. Maybe we ought to go back to some individuals in scripture who did this and learn from their example. I think of people like Ezra. Ezra came back from captivity and Nehemiah was his contemporary. He restored the wall, but Ezra helped to restore the law. Ezra 7 and verse 10, the Bible talks about him as a ready scribe. Now, Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to teach it and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Nehemiah 8 and verse 8 talks about a time when Nehemiah stood up before all of the people and read out of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense. And he calls the people to understand the reading. Decades before them, Jeremiah 15 and verse 16, it said of Jeremiah, your words are found and I did eat them and they were the rejoicing of my heart. Job said, I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. And as the Bible comes to a close in Revelation 10 and verse 10, we're told that John the apostle is given a scroll. He's told to eat it as sweet in his taste and bitter in his stomach. That is, there are some parts of the Bible that are hard to receive, that may be troubling and difficult. Jesus was accused of teaching hard sayings in John 6 and verse 60. But even then, we need to love it. Would somebody believe that you were a Lord of the Rings fan? If you never read, you, you never read any of the novels. I mean, you say, I really love Lord of the Rings or I really love Harry Potter or the Hunger Games. And you get into a discussion and people talk about, oh, do you remember when Harry did this? Or do you remember in this chapter when this happened? You say, oh, no, I didn't read any of the books. I just love it. And somebody says, well, can you explain? No, I don't. You say, well, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. I really love the Dallas Cowboys. You say, well, which era of the Dallas Cowboys was your favorite? Tom Landry, Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith. You say, I'm not familiar with any of those names. So I thought you loved the Dallas Cowboys. You say, yes, I do. I just don't know any of the players and I just don't watch any of the games. Would anybody believe that we really love God if we don't know anything about his word? Somebody says, what's your favorite book of the Bible? Well, I really don't have one. And, and do you remember when Rehoboam didn't know? I don't remember that. And surely you remember. Well, maybe you're a New Testament guy. Which one of Paul's epistles is your favorite? And can you tell me about the conversions in the book of Acts? You say, well, I, you see, I really love God with my heart and all of my soul, but not my mind. Jesus says we must love God with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength. And he won't be pleased with three out of four. God wants all of our mind. There was a man named Ronald Nelson or young boy at the time. He was a high school senior. He was accepted into all eight Ivy League schools. At the time of his decision, he decided to go to the University of Alabama. He rejected the Ivy League schools. And no, he wasn't a football player, as many people might assume with a decision like that one. The truth was, he said he went there because he was receiving the most financial aid from the University of Alabama. Most people would look at a man like Mr. Nelson and say, He's wasting his mind. He could have gone to Princeton or Harvard or Columbia, and he went to the University of Alabama. The truth is, no one wastes their minds like Christians who have at arm's reach continually the word of God and refuse to study it. Hosea 4 and verse 6, Hosea says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I will also reject you. Seeing you've forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children so they, they won't be a priest to me. We need to love God with all of our minds. Draw nearer to the word of God. There are so many ways today to get into the word. Somebody says, what do I do when I don't feel like reading the Bible, but I really love God? You can listen to the Bible on audio. You can pray to God, give you the strength. You can read congregationally with others on a reading plan that will keep you accountable and keep you putting one foot in front of the other as you try to study Isaiah talked about a time when people would need to be taught like little children, line upon line, precept upon precept. And maybe I need to do a little bit at a time. But, you know, some Bible's better than no Bible at all. A proverb a day might keep the devil away. I need to get the word of God into my system and into my bloodstream so that I can be the person that God would want me to be. Proverbs 7 and verse 2 says, keep my commandments and live. And my word or my law is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers and write them on the table or the tablets of your heart. I must not only love God with my mind by reading the word, but I must put it in my heart and then put it into practice. Paul Reber is a psychology professor at Northwestern University, and he was questioned once about the human mind. And he said he was asked, how, how good can the human mind remember? How strong is the human memory? And he said, you know, that's kind of hard to say. He said, the brain is made up of billions of neurons that work together to help human beings remember things. He said, the best I can do is compare it to one of those old DVD recorders. And he said, it would be like that recorder storing up 3 million years or 3 million hours of television 
or like one of those recorders being left on un- incessantly for 300 years. Now you say, well, I'm not really that good at math. The conclusion is we've got more room up here. We can remember, we can know the word of God and we can put it into our hearts and then put it into practice. Jesus said, love God with all of your mind. Think about the life of Christ. When he was tempted, what did he do? Quote scripture. When he was questioned, what did he do? Quote scripture. When he was crucified, if you go through the seven sayings on the cross, many of them come from the Old Testament Psalms. What did he do? He quoted scripture. If the son of God warded off the devil, fought off the devil and his attacks with the word of God, and we choose not to love God with all of our mind, what will we do in the day of temptation? But more than that, God loves us enough not only to give us the word of God initially through the apostles, but have it preserved and reliably translated into our own native tongue so that we can study it as much and as often as we would like. And do we really love God if we receive that and we say, I I won't study the word like I should. I won't put it into practice. The Quran is said to have about 6,300 verses, I believe. The New Testament is a little larger than that, in and around 8,000 verses or so. If a Muslim man memorizes the Quran, he's called in Hafiz. And if a woman memorizes the Quran, she's called in Hafiz. And many Muslims have. There's no salvation in the Quran. If you memorize it, believe it, and apply it, it won't get you any closer to heaven. In fact, it may get you further away. But we have the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Peter said that Jesus had the words of eternal life. And those men, Peter, John, and Andrew, and James, and Jude, they wrote those things down. And Paul, so that we might know the things most surely believed among us. And do we put as much practice and do we put as much dedication into knowing the word of God so that we can love God with all of our mind? God needs the best minds, not just the universities, not just our jobs, not just our favorite hobbies. God wants my mind as well. Number three, Jesus says, love God with all of your strength. In Matthew, Mark chapter 12, excuse me, after he says, love God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, Jesus says, now love God with all of your strength. That would involve my service to God. That would be the oomph that keeps me going. Once the mind is knowledgeable and once the heart is filled with the desire to do, the strength says, let's go out and put into practice what we know to be right, what we desire to do to please God. Let's go out and be servants. Jesus would often hear his disciples discussing this idea and he would just question them on this. In Mark chapter 10, verse 44 and 45, you remember Jesus is talking with his disciples and he says, whosoever would be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was saying in Christianity, it's not how high you can go, but how low can you go? Jesus is saying, don't reach for a trophy, reach for a towel. You be a servant, do the job that nobody else will do. And then you'll really be great. That's what he was trying to teach the disciples. And what we should say to ourselves is, am I going to love God with all of my strength? Am I going to give God my body, my energy? Am I going to lay it all on the line for Christ? This was true in the early church. There would be problems that would come up in the early church and there would be occasions like Acts chapter six, when they said, look out among yourselves and find seven men full of the spirit and honest report whom we may appoint over this business. That was the business of making sure that the Grecian widows were not neglected in the daily distribution of the bread. I believe that the number was limited to seven. Because the early church was so vigorous and so servant hearted that if the apostles had not limited the number to seven, everybody would have wanted to serve. You have men, men's work days at the congregation of which you are a member. And if so, do you ever make yourself available to participate in those things? What about ladies days and women's programs where maybe you can do something to help or to assist What about teaching Bible classes and maybe folding or preparing a program or maybe greeting a visitor? There are just so many ways that we can and must love God with all of our strength. And sometimes nobody does what everybody knows ought to be done because we think somebody else will do it. And that somebody, if possible, should be us. The question in Christianity is not, am I going to hell if I miss Sunday night or do I have to come back Wednesday night? The question in Christianity is not how little amount of service do I have to give to God to still be acceptable to him? The question is, because I've been saved by grace through faith, how much can I render unto him? Psalm 116 and verse 12, what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? The God who created me, provides for me, sent Christ on my behalf, 
and provided a plan of redemption whereby I can be saved. What can I render unto him for all of his benefits toward me? And whatever he says, that's ultimately what I want to do because it's my desire to glorify him and to live for him. I'm reminded of Paul's statement in Romans 12 and verse 1, where Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and that perfect will of God. Paul is saying Christianity involves your body. In the Old Testament, the sacrifice was a dead sacrifice. That animal was sacrificed whether or not he wanted to be. He was dead and done and offered up. But we're a living sacrifice, and God's not going to track us down and take our bodies from us. But Paul says, instead, based on all that God has done for you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. See, that's a daily decision to crawl on the altar for God and say, I am going to sacrifice myself daily in whatever way I can. That is loving God with all of our strength, doing what we can for him. Maybe you say, I, I can't preach and I can't teach and I can't lead singing. But what if you made a list of all of the things that you can do? What if you thought about all of the ways that you can effectively serve? What if you put into practice what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 12? 12 down through 25, where he says every member of the body has a function and the foot can't say to the hand or the eye, I have no need of you, but God has placed every one of the members of the body in particular in the church. He set them there for his own good and glory. And there's something that you can and must do for God. And that's what God wants you to work at. Remember, Christianity is the only endeavor in the world that you can have this guarantee. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the resurrection and how true it is. And he says, if Christ be not raised, everything we're doing is worthless and fruitless. There's no point to Christianity if Jesus is still in the grave, but Jesus did rise from the grave. There is a resurrection. And so he says in verse 58, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We have never done anything for the Lord in vain. When Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your strength, he's not saying you're going to do something and not receive a return on it. Paul says, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We've never done anything for him in vain. God sees, God knows, and God rewards. And that ought to be encouragement for us to press on, to give it our very best, and to be faithful. In John 21, Jesus is about to head back to heaven soon, and he's talking to Peter, and he says, Peter, do you love me? He does this three times, and you remember, Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus says, feed my sheep. And then as they're walking, Peter sees John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, trailing behind, and he turns around and says, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus says, if I will that he remain alive till I come, what is that to you? You focus on following me. And sometimes as we try to love God with all of our strength, we, like Peter, turn around and make sure the next man is doing his job or her job. And Jesus is saying, that's really not your concern. In the end, Christianity, though congregational, though it involves our involvement with other Christians, it's really about me and my Lord one on one as I seek to serve him, to be faithful to him. And I need to do my part. I need to do my duty and follow him no matter who else will or who won't. And then number four, Jesus says, and love your neighbor as yourself, Mark chapter 12 and verse 31. They came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment in the law? But Jesus, he did better than that in that he gave them one free. He went to Leviticus. Yes, I know we don't often spend time in the book of Leviticus, but Jesus says there's gold in Leviticus. Leviticus 19, 18 co contains the second greatest command, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. God wants us to treat our neighbors as if we were treating our very selves. We're to love our neighbors just like we love ourselves. That's what honors and glorifies God. The world's all over this second commandment, or at least they try to be. They don't really care about God. We live in a world that wants to rid itself of God, who doesn't care if God exists, who actually uses the time, the talents, the brains and intellect that God blessed them with to disprove his existence, which can't be done. But they'll do anything, or at least they'll claim to try to do anything for their fellow man. They're all over commandment number two as they just step over and trample on command number one. It can't be done. But maybe sometimes as Christians, we're all over command number one and we overlook commandment number two. 
Jesus didn't say the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is down here. He says the second is like it. That is, Jesus put these on par one with another. And he says, the second is like, namely this, you will love your neighbor like you love yourself. Isn't this what John taught in 1 John chapter 4, 19 through 21, where he says, how can a man love God whom he hasn't seen, but hates his brother whom he has seen? If you won't love your brother whom you have seen, you don't really love the God whom you haven't. We love God to the degree that we love image bearers, those that are made in the image of God. In Genesis 1, we're told in verse 26 down through 28, God made man in his own image, and the image of God made he him. That's true about everybody. We're the apple of his eye, Psalm 17, 8, Zechariah 2 and verse 8. And how we treat people matters to God. We need to love our neighbor as ourselves. In Luke's parallel account to this, or maybe on a separate occasion, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 25, a certain scribe comes to Jesus and he says, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus says, what's in the law? How do you read it? He says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you've answered rightly. Do this and you'll live. But the man willing to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus told him this parable. A certain man went down to Jericho, fell among thieves. They left him half dead. And you remember a priest came by that way, passed by on the other side. A Levite had the decency to look in on the man, but he did nothing about it. But a Samaritan going on that way, he saw him, took care of him, poured in oil and wine, bandaged up his wounds, took him to the local inn, gave two pence or two denarii and told the attendant there, What more he owes upon my return, I will repay. You just take care of him. Jesus says, now, which one of these do you believe was neighbor to him? At which time the scribe says, he that had mercy on him. Jesus says, you go and you do likewise. Jesus didn't teach that parable because people need to know how to treat other people. You don't have to tell a grandparent that, hey, if you ever see your granddaughter in the ditch, you read Luke 10, 25 through 37, and you go pour in oil and wine, and you pour in the peroxide and bandage her up and do whatever you need to do for them. You don't have to do that. You don't have to tell a husband this about his spouse necessarily. He knows to love her like he loves his own flesh, Ephesians 5, 28 and 29. But Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan for this reason. Everybody's the Good Samaritan when they get to choose their neighbor, but we can't. Jesus is saying, love your neighbor as yourself, regardless of who your neighbor may be. He picks a situation where a hostile Samaritan is kind to his cultural rival, a Jew, and he outdoes both the priest and the Levite. And we may make excuses for them and say, well, maybe they had to get to worship service, can't conduct it without the priest and the Levite. And God forbid that they become ceremonially unclean as they would tend this individual with blood. They were going to read and study about the law. This man was actually doing what the law commanded. And that's what God wants us to do, to love our neighbor as ourselves. You see, the Bible takes for granted that you love yourself. Matthew 7 and verse 12, the golden rule, Jesus says, All things, therefore, whatsoever you would that men do to you, do even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. God just takes for granted. He talks to husbands and he says, no man ever hates his own flesh, but instead he will nourish it and cherish it, even as the Lord does for the church. But God says, the same way you care about yourself, I want you to do that for others. And maybe we've heard passages like this and we've heard these points about loving our neighbor. And maybe we think to ourselves, I'm going to get on a plane and go halfway around the world. And that's great. And I've done foreign mission work and I know many people that have. And that's a needed and a right thing to do. But maybe we overlook our neighbors that are right in our homes. How are you treating your wife? How are you treating your children? Even on your worst days when you're frustrated, you know, they're your neighbors. How are you treating the person at McDonald's who can't hear no mayonnaise for the third time or no mustard or whatever it might be that messes up your order? How are we treating those folks? You see, God's not only interested in what we do for strangers that we've never met. He's also interested in how we treat the people in the congregations where we worship and serve, how we treat the people that we really can't stand or we think they can't stand us. God says they're still your neighbors. I want you to treat them with love and respect. Because, you know, in Romans 5, we're told that when we were yet ungodly, Christ died for us. That's our motivation to treat our neighbors rightly, because when we were enemies of God, Christ came across the clouds for us so that we might be reconciled to God. And so we ought to love our neighbors as ourselves, because that's what God's done for us in Christ. 
The Bible teaches us that we need to be individuals that would love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love our neighbor as ourselves. The scribe says, who's my neighbor? Jesus shows them essentially. That applies to everybody. There are no limitations. God wants us to do for others what he's done for us. God loves you. God loves me. The Bible teaches us that God created you. He provides for you. He sent Christ and even provides a plan of salvation whereby we can be saved. And in a, in a word, what God wants from us in response is God wants our love. He wants us to love him with the heart, soul, mind, and strength. His commandments aren't burdensome, 1 John 5, 3. It can be done. God can be pleased. And that's the blessing about the God that we serve. God can be pleased. And if we would submit to him, he'll be glorified in us. Jesus is questioned and Jesus gives the right answer. It's one thing to quote these verses. It's one thing to know these verses, but it's an eternal blessing to actually put them into practice. To love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves.